Hey crew, it's Pitt, and I'm back with some more Esoterica. Today we are diving back into the works of Rudolf Steiner. This is Building Stones for an Understanding of the Mystery of Golgotha. We are on Lecture 6. We are reading aloud and discussing as we go along the various points of interest brought to light by the text. It's not the format for everyone, but you are more than welcome to tag along because some people seem to find enjoyment in it. Before we begin, however, if you are unfamiliar with me, any of my unconventional beliefs, or if at any point in time I lose you in the terminology, there are several playlists linked in the corner above and in the box down below, along with the original source material so that you can get a better understanding of why I stand where I do. There are reasons. With that being said, we are going to dive into and be continue our exploration of the building stones for an understanding of the mystery of Golgotha. This is Lecture 6 from April 17th of 1917. We shall better understand the real nature of the events of today and especially of the immediate future if, from a spiritual angle, we see them as the continuation of the events which took place during the early years of Christianity. This may seem paradoxical today, yes. It is difficult to bring home to the majority of people how certain forces, which at that time had been implanted in and had made a deep impact upon the evolution of the earth and man, are still operative today because, in the present climate of contemporary thought, they fail to perceive the deeper impulses, the deep underlying forces that are at work in contemporary events. They prefer to approach everything from a purely superficial standpoint. These deeper spiritual forces are not accessible to mankind today because people are not prepared to investigate them. And once again, we are going to stop and point out that this is patent. Well, this is untrue that they are not accessible, but it is because people do not investigate them, right? So it is both true and untrue at the same time. You have access to the spiritual. That is completely separated from the control systems, which are Judaism and Christianity, among a myriad of others. You are free to leave the control system. You are free to find for yourself the spiritual nature of things. You do that through prayer, fasting, and meditation, and the dedication to refine the temple, and several other steps that are outlined in the Infinite Integrations playlist and are... I have given the reasons for in the unconventional Bible study. So you can have access to the spiritual. Anybody that is telling you that it is not true is lying to you. You can do the things and achieve the results. And it is completely separated from calling upon anybody's name. Anyone who wishes to penetrate a little beneath the surface events of our time will find in many a published document and in the vicissitudes of fortune that befall of those who are unaware of the motives that determine their actions, impulses that are often a continuation, a resurgence of certain impulses that were manifested especially in the early centuries of the Christian era. It is not even possible to characterize the outstanding examples of the resurgence of ancient impulses in our present age because people cannot endure their characterization. That is true. If you have taken the time, which most people don't, I don't blame you, it's long. I have a Bible study. We did a rather extensive Bible study. We went through and did a whole lot of word studies. We did a lot of understanding the underneath. With a spiritual lens being removed, two of them actually. One, that the Jews were destined to do this because they were chosen people, right? God can choose a person, but he doesn't choose a people. And throughout taking off the lens that Christ had to die for your sins because that was not a thing. I've explained that in extreme detail. The entities that are... Right? There are entities that are based in the betterment of mankind, and there are entities based in the not betterment of mankind. Those entities feed off of your energy. The things that you invest into their systems. That is not restricted from Christianity. There is an entity feeding off of that. It is the same entity that feeds off of Judaism. And you should definitely go back at least through Genesis and Exodus and understand that a little bit better before you continue on the path of feeding those entities. 
people cannot endure the characterization because there is some truth that you don't know. There are spiritual truths that you can know and don't take my word for it. Put into practice the things that I am telling you and they will be revealed to you. Prayer, fasting, and meditation. Take it directly to God and he will let you know. These entities feed upon death. They feed upon destruction. They feed upon fear. They feed upon a variety of the negative emotions of humanity. What have been the fruits from Christianity? Has it been peace, love, and acceptance? Is that what we have seen being fruitful in Christianity? Or is it the opposite? Is it intolerance? Is it violence? Is that what we see? That is what we see. The implementation of Christianity, even in its best times, was at the point of a sword. You don't have to like that, but it is a truth. Even in the time of Constantine, when the greatest advancement of the religion happened, it was a, okay, the emperor decided this is the thing that is. And if you don't go along with it, it is not going to go well with you. Right? That is how it came about. And the spread of it came explicitly at the point of a sword. The Germanic peoples did not believe in Christianity until they started dying in great numbers. The Celtic peoples, same thing. The Franks, the Normans, all of those people. When they came over onto this continent, it was the same thing. You will believe what we will believe or you will die. That is what they did. They took children and re-educated them. That has been the fruits. That is what we have seen born out from Christianity. That's because you're feeding the wrong things. You're feeding fear, right? You are fearful that you will be condemned to hell. That is feeding fear. You're not going to be condemned to hell. That is not a biblical concept. Go back to the Old Testament. There is no hell in the Old Testament. It suddenly sprang up. I wonder why. It's because they wanted you scared of something. Those entities feed off of fear. They feed off of death. They feed off of blood. That's why you had blood sacrifices. Every single time that there was a blood sacrifice, it was the wrong thing. And yet, it was rewarded. I wonder why. But, those who study the first Christian centuries in Europe from a certain standpoint will be able to detect the forces that are emerging once again and are actively at work. That is what I just said. I have, therefore, attempted to draw your attention to certain phenomena. Phenomena? connected with the expansion of Christianity in the first centuries AD, because though appropriate use of the ideas derived from them through the, through the appropriate use of ideas derived from them, I missed an R there, much that is taking place today will immediately become clear to you. <laughs> I propose to add further information based upon our recent investigations, which we can discuss in detail later, let us first look at this new material so that our later inquiry may bear fruit. I have often spoke to you of the remarkable fact that the early Roman emperors acquired initiation by constraint, and this explains many of their actions. Consequently, they gained knowledge of certain facts connected with the great impulses of cosmic events, but they exploited this knowledge derived from the mysteries to their own advantage. It is most important to realize that the intervention of the Christ impulse into the historical life of mankind was not merely an event on the physical plane which we can apprehend through a study of historical facts, but was a genuinely spiritual event. I have already pointed out that the gospel report that Christ was known to the devils has deeper implications than is usually recognized. We are told that Christ performed acts of healing, which are described in the Gospels as the casting out of evil spirits. <laughs> and we are constantly reminded that the devil knew who Christ was. On the other hand, Christ himself rebuked the devils and suffered them not to speak, for they knew he was the Christ. <laughs> Fall back to Mark and Luke, and we will talk about that in greater detail. The appearance of Christ, therefore, was not only a matter for the judgment of men, it is possible that at first people did not have the slightest inkling of what the coming of Christ presaged. But the devils, beings belonging to a supersensible world, recognized him. All right, so we're going to pause. It is indeed recorded 
that this happened. But that is not necessarily something that we can take entirely upon faith. I take a lot of things on faith, but most of the things that I talk about, I have experienced. When I talk about the spiritual things, I have experienced those things. Once again, I cannot give you the experience. I can only relay it to you. I can't convince you, and I'm not even here to try. I'm here to tell you. Spirituality is real. These entities, they are real. Whether or not they called him out as the divine being, I don't believe, right? I, I, I don't believe. It could be true. I hold out the possibility, but it is a very, very slight possibility because of the entire rest of the Bible study. I understand that that is an overwhelming thing. If you have been brought up in the control systems, saying something like that is automatically going to put you on edge. But I have 161 videos. I understand that's a big slog. That is not something that most people are going to go through. I don't expect it to happen. I did the Bible study for myself, right? That I'm an I, that's what I do. I use the thing and then I give it away freely. I did it for myself to prove things to myself, to see why I believe the things that I believed. And through the course of the Bible study, I discovered that the most of it is lies. A, a large, large portion of that has been taken. It has been stolen from other peoples. The Noah, the, the story of Noah, the flood, that could have happened, but it is remarkably similar to what happened to Utapishtinim in the Sumerian uh, king's list, right? I'm, it was Sumeria, I'm pretty sure. I forget which, which tablets it was, but it was in the tablets, right? Utapishtinim was Noah, and he had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, or pretty close approximations of the names. And it predates every single instance of the Noah story in existence. Moses took the story of Utapishnim and changed it to something that fit closer to what he wanted. That is a repeated pattern throughout the Bible. The virgin birth, completely misinterpreted, like completely off base. There are a myriad of these prophecies which are taken as fact because you want to believe that this is the truth. And they are simply not. You can go back and read for yourself. Go back. I did it for you. The Bible study will walk you through it. They do not bear true. It is not true fruits. But these entities, they are real. They do harvest energy. You don't have to believe that. I am not here to convince you of that. I have to relay these things. These entities feed off of your energies. What you put into it is what they feed off of. But they feed the, the ones that are aligned for the not betterment of mankind. They feed off of fear. They feed off of hate. They feed off of judgment. They feed off of the vices. The other ones feed more off of the virtues. They also consume your energies. It is part of the process. It is evident through the text. And I'm not going to go back through all of the texts, right? We did that. We have 161 videos. But it is really easy to hear me start talking about this. And I say, well, that's not true. And you're like, well, who says that? I say that. That is me, full-chested, me. But it is through the study, right? I say these things because it is evident through the works. You can see that despite the best efforts of men... God's word prevails. God's word is this. You can go to him and ask for forgiveness. Period. The end. You can turn to him and say, God, I'm sorry. I messed up. And he will forgive you every single time. Does that mean that you get to continue in the, the works that led you to that? No. There needs to be a change. It needs to be within you. You need to follow the right things. But you can do it. You can turn to God at <clears throat> any point. Nothing ever had to die for you to be forgiven for sin. Nothing, no animal, no plant, no human. <clears throat> Nothing had to die for you to be forgiven from sin. That is a fundamental problem. Fall back, 
to the Bible study if you would like more on that. I go into excruciating detail. We go through even all the begats. We go through the chronicles and all of the things that are boring. We went through them for a reason. These entities are real, and one of them is attached to the control system through which you are trying to purvey. And yes, there were recordings, right? People can record anything they want. The apostles, right? The apostles who wrote the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and that is the best interpretation of that is that they did it. It is almost certain that they did not, that it was a hundred years or so after them that it was written down and it was an oral account that was translated into writing. So it is the best intention to say that they wrote it, but they were forming a religion. You don't have to like that again, but it is a truth. They were forming a religion. They were separating themselves from Judaism. They were saying, hey, here's all of these blood sacrifices. We're going to do something different. I believe that Christ came and he was trying to put an end to the blood sacrifice and we made a whole religion out of the blood sacrifice. And the iconography that is associated with that helps to feed into those entities that like the blood sacrifice. The same type of entities that caused a lot of destruction. Some pretty horrible things. Once again, I refer you back to the Bible study. The super sensible world, therefore, knew of his advent. That is what is recorded. The more informed leaders of the early Christians were firmly convinced that the coming of Christianity was not merely an event on the terrestrial plane, but something that was related to the spiritual world. Something which evoked a radical change in the spiritual world. Without a shadow of a doubt, the leading spirits of early Christianity were firmly persuaded of this. Now, it is a remarkable phenomenon that the Roman emperors, because of their forced initiation, which gave insight to the spiritual world, had a presentiment of the far-reaching importance of the Christ impulse. There were some emperors, however, who despite their irregular initiation, understood little of these secrets. But there were others who understood so much that they were able to divine something of the power and effectiveness of the Christ mystery. And it was these more talented, the more perspacious emperors who began to pursue a definite policy towards Christianity, which was then gaining ground. Indeed, the first emperor to adopt this policy was Tiberius, who succeeded Augustus, though the objection might be raised that Christianity was not as yet widely diffused. This objection, however, is not valid, for when he learned of Christ's birth in Palestine, Tiberius, who had received a partial initiation into the ancient mysteries, realized its significance. <clears throat> Let us consider for a moment that policy towards Christianity which began under Tiberius and was pursued by all the initiated emperors. Tiberius announced his intention to admit Christ to the Roman pantheon. The Roman Empire pursued a deliberate policy towards the worship of the gods. In essence, it was as follows. When the Romans conquered a people, they received the gods of the newly conquered people into their Olympus. They declared that these gods were also deserving of veneration, and they were added to the Roman pantheon. The object of this policy, therefore, was to appropriate not only the material or temporal goods, but also the spiritual forces of the conquered people. The initiated Caesars, Saul, and the gods something more than mere external images. They had a deeper understanding than the people. A collective belief can shape reality. That is something that is hard for people, but when it says where three or more gather and do, then it is done, that is what they are talking about. If we come into accord in a direction, then that direction is a more likely one to come. The more people who are directly creating that result, the more likely that result is to come to fruition. So that is what was being done. The Caesars, through their spiritual initiation, understood the entities. 
they understood the energetic investment involved with the entities. And they understood that if you go in and start shitting on somebody's gods, they're probably going to get a little bit more upset with you than if you accept their gods. So all of those things play a part. I really do believe that they knew some spiritual things. There is significant evidence to say that at least some of them did, right? I don't know about Nero, right? It is really hard to do the things that I do and then to take the actions of Caligula and Nero. That is, <laughs> now, that does not mean that they did not align themselves with one of these entities. Those entities are designed to lead you wrong. They are able to deceive you into believing that they are doing something that they are not. See Abraham. They knew that the visible image of the gods concealed real spiritual powers pertaining to the different hierarchies. Their policy was perfectly consistent and comprehensible, for the authoritarian principle of Rome was consciously reinforced by the power which was believed to derive from the assimilation of other gods. And, as a rule, the worship of other gods was accepted not only in an outward and exoteric way, but the mystery teachings of other peoples were also taken over by the Roman mystery centers and merged with the mystery cult of the Roman Empire. And this, in its entirety, this, 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 this how long is this sentence? That long sentence right there. This explains Catholicism. If you pay attention to what is being said right here, you can understand Catholicism and all the iconography and all of the different festivals and the different holidays, right? This explains that in great detail in one sentence. And since at that time it was generally held that it was neither right nor possible to govern without the support of the spiritual powers symbolized by the gods, this practice was taken for granted. The aim of Tiberius, therefore, was to integrate the power of Christ, as he conceived it, with the impulses proceeding from the other deities recognized by him and his peoples. The Roman Senate thwarted his intention and nothing came of it. Nonetheless, the initiated emperors, Hadrian among them, made repeated efforts to achieve this goal, but constantly met with opposition from the dignitaries who could make their influence felt. And when we examine the objections raised against this policy of the initiated emperors, we can form a good idea of what happened at this decisive turning point in human evolution. We witness here a remarkable coincidence. On countless occasions, Roman writers, influential personalities, and large sections of the Roman populace accused the Christians of profaning what others held sacred, and vice versa. In other words, the Romans repeatedly emphasized that the Christians were radically different in thought and feeling from the Romans and other peoples. For the other peoples, together with their gods, had been assimilated by the Romans. Thus, everyone looked upon the Christians as people with a different makeup, people with different feelings and responses. Now, this view could be dismissed as a calumny, such like accusations are always ready to hand, of course, when one takes a superficial view of history. But we cannot regard this view as a calumny when we realize that many of the opinions of earlier times and many of the contemporary opinions concerning the mystery of Golgotha have passed over verbatim into Christian teaching. <clears throat> to put it more clearly, <clears throat> The Christians expressed their sentiments in words that could be found amongst many of their contemporaries. One of these was Philo of Alexandria. See note one. We're going to go ahead and pop that out and check it out. <clears throat> Sorry, man, that has taken a long time. Come on, sometime today. A contemporary of Christ <clears throat> who probably had first-hand knowledge in, of what was later found in the Christian writings. All right, is this up yet? It went all the way to the top. Let's take it down to the bottom. All the way. All right. Note one. Philo of Alexandria, or Philo Judaeus, circa 30 B.C. to A.D. 40, was an important representative of Hellenistic Judaism. He believed that the Pentateuch had divine authority, 
In his Allegories of the Sacred Law, a commentary on Genesis, he regarded the characters in Genesis as allegories of states of soul. He is considered to be the first religious philosopher. A contemporary of Christ who probably had first-hand knowledge of what was later found in the Christian writings. Philo makes the following remarkable statement. According to tradition, to traditional teachings, I must hate that which others love. He is referring to the Romans, and love that which others hate. If you bear this statement in mind and turn to the Gospel of St. Matthew, you will find countless passages which echo this statement of Philo, and so that we can say that Christianity has developed, as it were, out of a spiritual aura that required people to say, we love what others hate. This means, and this saying was quoted in the early Christian communities and served as one of the fundamental principles of Christian teachings, that Christians themselves openly acknowledged what others reproached them with. It was not therefore a calumny. It accorded with the Roman view. The Christians love what we hate and hate what we love. And the Christians, for their part, said exactly the same of the Romans. I say much the same thing these days, right? I, I, I have seen what you cheer, so you are free to boo away. That is, I, I really do live that way, right? If you support the death of children in the womb, we do not see eye to eye, and we will not, right? We can have arguments, but it is not going to move either one of us, so it is better that we do not associate. I hate what you love. It is the same for a variety of things. I hate everything that comes on the television, I do. I don't like it at all. The things that come out in the movies, don't like that shit. I don't deal with it, right? It is promoting things which I am diametrically opposed to. You can say the same for various parts of Christianity. We have talked about some of them when we talked about the holy days, right? The Ishtar and Easter, same thing. Christmas and the Christmas tree, completely anti-biblical. Like, you cannot call yourself a Christian and put up a Christmas tree, if you do, you have not done your research. It is clear, therefore, that something wholly different from anything that had been known before now entered human evolution. Otherwise, it would not have been, had so great an impact. Of course, if we wish to understand this whole situation, we must realize that the new impulse had come from the spiritual worlds. Many, who were contemporaries of the mystery of Golgotha, such as Philo, caught a fleeting glimpses of it, which they described each after their own fashion. And so, many of the passages from the Gospel, which are... Let, let's stop, right? This right here, it is important to pay attention. This is separated from Christ. Yes, they were contemporaries, but he was not a Christian. <clears throat> and... So, many of the passages from the Gospels, which are interpreted expediently today, as in the case of Beret, whom I mentioned at the conclusion of my last lecture, will be seen in their true light when we cease to interpret them to our convenience. But when our interpretation is determined by the whole spirit of the age, there are strange interpretations in bars. Indeed, biblical ex exegesis assumes very strange forms nowadays, much that Philo says agrees closely with the Gospels, and I would like to quote a passage which shows that because he was not inspired to the same extent as the later evangelists, as were the evangelists later, his style was rather different from theirs. I wonder why. As a talented writer in the popular sense, he made less heavy demands upon the reader than the evangelist. One notable passage, Philo gave expression to something that was occupying the hearts and minds of the men of his time. He says, Do not concern yourselves with the genealogical records or the documents of despots. Take no thought for the things of the body do not attribute to the citizen civic rights or civic liberties, which you deny to those of humble origin or who have been purchased as slaves in the market, but give heed only to the ancestry of the soul. If the Gospels are read with an understanding, one cannot fail to recognize that something of this attitude of mind, albeit raised to a higher level, pervades the Gospels. <laughs> and why, therefore, an opportunist like Beret can write the passages quoted, I quoted to you in my last lecture. 
we should do well to bear his words in mind, and I propose, therefore, to read them to you once again. It is a waste of time to look for the afterlife. Perhaps it does not even exist. No matter how we approach the question, we are never vouchsafed an answer. Let us leave all occultism to adepts and charlatans. Mysticism of every kind is totally irrational. Let us submit to the authority of the church, because with the traditional teaching and practical experience of centuries, she prescribes the code of ethics in which nations and children must be instructed. And we finally, finally we must submit, because, far from exposing us to the dangers of mysticism, she actively protects us against them, silences the voices of the mystery teachings, expounds the gospels, and tailors the liberal anarchy to the Savior, to the needs of modern society. The church is no example. I know I hit this often, and I try to do it gently because I am couching it in love. The church was a horrible experience for millions of people, right? Some people find peace within the control system, and most people just go along with the control system because it is a system. But during the outlay of Christianity, people died in great numbers. They were sacrificed to the entity of the church, right? But they're pagan. It doesn't matter. They don't understand what they're doing. We can just go in and kill them until they submit. It's fine. It is our right by God to conquer them. That is the example, the teaching and practical experience of centuries of the church. The repercussions from that are still being felt, right? The things that happen to the the Native Americans, the people who were on this continent prior to its discovery by Columbus, the things that happened to them are horrible. We went in, I, I'm not even counting the initial smallpox spread, right? I'm not counting the initial, we are going to take your lands, but like the later stuff where the church came in with force and they took entire communities and separated parents from children so that the children could not learn the ways of the parents because you know that's that's God's will it was horrible horrible and anything that springs from that by necessity must indeed be pretty horrible there was a reason for the Protestant Reformation and even that did not get it right that led us into the inquisitions right the various persecutions of people who were different those who could do something that that couldn't explain. There is nothing that I am here to tell you that is outside of the bounds of God. Everything that I am telling you to do comes through prayer, fasting, and meditation and taking it directly to God with no intervention from any entity. That is where truth is found. In the passage which I quoted from Philo, we can see since it is echoed again and again in the New Testament, what lies behind this whole movement. Philo's reference to the ancestry of the soul carries profound implications. He implies something that is opposed to the leading ideas of the Roman Empire. For the Roman Empire recognized only physical inheritance in its various forms, and the whole social order was founded on this principle. And suddenly the cry was raised, Take no thought for the ancestry of the body, but give heed only to the ancestry of the soul. One could hardly imagine a more radical breach with the fundamental principles of the Roman Empire, a greater contrast. And this contrast was raised to a higher level by the advent of Christ Jesus. Indeed, the world had been waiting for this moment and was vigorously opposed to the existing world order of that time. The Roman emperors would have been only too pleased to receive Christ into their pantheon as a new god amongst the other gods, though he struck at the very roots of their society. <clears throat> For the Christ God, who embodies a far deeper reality, would thereby have become one of their own gods. But the initiated emperors soon realized that the advent of the Christ would be fraught with difficulties for them. When the initiation of the emperors as was the case in Rome after Augustus, had been made obligatory by imperial decree. 
The forces of initiation exercised a powerful influence in the external world. They influenced the policies of the emperors and were operative in the measures and impulses which shape society. The aims and intentions of the initiated emperors were more clearly defined, more uncompromising than those of the ordinary initiate. Suppose, for example, that one of the emperors who had received initiation had said, Now, John the Baptist baptized with water. Through this baptism by water, the etheric body was loosened. The initiated emperors were, of course, aware of this, and the candidates for baptism thereby gained insight into the inner structure of the spiritual world. I want to emphasize once again that baptism by water does nothing for your etheric body. It is an outward display of an inward commitment, and that is the extent of it. It does not save you at any way, in any shape or form. It is a tool of acceptance, true, and therefore it does, by like a hair's breadth, influence, but it does nothing by itself. If there is not a genuine turn in your heart, it doesn't do no good to get dunked in water or have it splashed in your face. None. There is no salvific properties in the water. And it most certainly does not loosen the etheric body, right, at all. They were aware that a decisive turning point in the history of the world had now been reached. This was known to those whose etheric bodies had been loosened through total immersion. Now, let us suppose that one of these emperors had said, I accept the challenge. Such things were not unknown in the mysteries. I am prepared to do battle against that which has entered the world at this decisive moment in history. One must realize how autocratic, self-willed these emperors were. But they never dreamt for a moment that they might be powerless against the will of the gods. They were determined, and it was for this purpose they had themselves initiated to try issue with the spiritual world impulses and to stem the tide of the world evolution. Such things had already happened before and they are happening before our eyes today. Only people are unaware of it. Here is a historical incident that confirms the hypothesis I have suggested above. In the age of Constantine, Licinius ruled over the eastern part of the empire he took it upon himself to challenge the gods. He decided to celebrate a cult act, for these ritual performances symbolized the structure struggle against the spiritual powers. The ceremony was intended to demonstrate publicly that he had undertaken to challenge the gods. In other words, he wished to ridicule baptism in the eyes of his fellow men, for it was baptism that had made known to the world that the turning point in the world history had come, not true. <laughs> and so challenge Christianity and blunt the force of the Christian impulse. To this end, a festival was organized at Heliopolis. It was arranged that an actor, Gelasius, should be dressed in white robes of a priest and be immersed in water. It was to be presented as a spectacle, as a burlesque of Christian baptism. Gelasius, clothed in white, was immersed in water and was taken out again. He was then exposed to the assembled populace as an object of ridicule. And what had happened and what happened? Gelasius turned to the people and said, I have now become a Christian and I will remain a Christian with all the strength at my command. Licinius had received his answer from the spiritual world. Baptism was no longer an object of ridicule. The effects of baptism were demonstrated for all the world to see. He, Licinius, recognized that the critical moment in world history had arrived. This initiated emperor had taken it upon himself to challenge the gods and received his answer. So, hold on. This was in the age of Constantine. Now, Licinius may have been before, no, he ruled over the eastern part. So this was at the time of Constantine, and Constantine was the guy who decided Christianity was going to be the way to go. And so, it is not outside of the realm of speculation, and this is merely speculation, that this guy had already become a Christian. And, by his baptism, took it upon himself to emphasize the fact that this was the correct religion. Now, 
That is speculation. That is not something I can be firm upon, but it is definitely a possibility that that happened. We see that happen all of the time. People convince themselves that this thing is true, and then they go and tell you that this thing is true, even if they do not have a supporting evidence. And there are people who do it intentionally to deceive. If you don't believe that, you should check out some of these prosperity preachers. It is hardly possible for us today to form an idea of the significance of this answer. It was seen by all, even the heathen, as a complete vindication of baptism, a valid answer, an answer that had to be reckoned with, and those who at that time were initiated into the secrets of the world events received a momentary illumination from another source and were granted insight into the meaning and import of Christianity. Widely different customs had an occult meaning, which had an occult meaning, had survived from ancient times. Under the Antonines, for example, the Sibyls delivered their oracles. People consulted them and took their instructions from them. We have dealt with the oracles that is part of the ancient lore uh, playlist. One important oracle of the time of the Antonines predicted that Rome was, Rome was doomed to destruction, that ancient Rome would not survive. Now, oracular utterances, though often ambiguous and open to various interpretations, can be correctly interpreted. This particular oracle gave out this strange prophecy. Rome will perish and the place where the city once stood will become the haunt of foxes and wolves. This was a sign that had to be reckoned with. People naturally looked for a deeper meaning, but they felt that the turning point of world history had arrived. The might of Rome would be extinguished. Foxes and wolves would lord it amongst the ruins and take over in her place. The, the argument can be made that that was the Christian church, the foxes and wolves. Oracles, of course, often speak ambiguously, but occasionally, even in those times, the aura of initiation was transmitted through an ordinary, uninitiated sage, so that he frequently uttered remarkable prophecies which could only be construed as referring to the turning point of world evolution. <clears throat> In my last lecture, I spoke of Nero and told you what this initiate emperor really thought. He wished to set the whole world on fire so that he might witness its destruction in person. If Rome, as the center of world power, was to be destroyed, at least he wished to determine for himself the manner of its destruction. Seneca once warned him in a remarkable statement which can be understood only if we are aware that the Roman Empire emperors were in possession of the principle of initiation, believed themselves to be endowed with divine authority, which the Christians refused to honor. Seneca, who knew of no other way of bringing the, his message home to the tyrant, said to Nero, You have absolute power. You have unlimited authority. You can even order the death of those whom you think may contribute in some way to the world order that will follow the downfall of Rome. But there is one thing a despot cannot do. He cannot compass the death of his successor. These words had profound implications. Seneca was referring, of course, not to the potential successor, if the occasion should arise, but to the actual successor. Seneca wished to indicate that death set a limit to the emperor's power. The belief that Rome was doomed had an important influence, especially upon imperial circles. The Christians reacted differently from the Romans to this tradition. Here... We are here faced with a paradoxical situation. The Christians, for their part, championed the idea that Rome would not perish, that her dominion would endure to the end, which always implied the end of an era. It was the Christians, therefore, who upheld the view that the dominion of Rome would endure, that it would outlive the time of the foxes and wolves. Not that the Christians would have denied, if I may risk an oracular statement, that Rome would become the habitat of wolves and foxes. They agreed that it was possible, but they maintained, on the other hand, that her power would endure. We must bear in mind these different attitudes or opinions. Many of them have, in fact, proved to be correct. 
For example, the mother of Alexander Severus, who was a pupil of Origen, though although suspected of heresy, he was nonetheless regarded as a kind of church father. Oh, suspected of heresy and a church father. Oh, that's interesting. I'm not well versed in that part of church history, so had managed to set up a kind of pantheon for her private use. In her private sanctuary, she equally, she revered equally Abraham, Christ, Orpheus, and Apollyonus of Tyana, and she considered the worship of these four deities was indispensable for her salvation. As a devoted pupil of Origen, she found that this practice was in no way contrary to his teaching. When we consider these different shades of opinion, which I have tried to outline briefly, we find that they reflect the atmosphere of the first three centuries of our era. And during this period, we find repeated attempts by initiated emperors to come to terms with Christianity and to incorporate Christianity into their religious system. Despite the recorded persecutions of the Christians, this was the imperial policy up to the 4th century. Now, in the 4th century, a remarkable personality appeared on the scene in the shape of the Emperor Constantine, and that is note 2, so we will read it. Constantine was firmly convinced of his divine mission to rule over the world and to establish the orthodox teaching of the church. He prided himself on having settled the Donatist conflict and the Arian heresy. On his initiative, the Council of Nicaea was compelled to introduce the doctrine of the Philicu, which split the church for a century and a half. That's, that's some interesting knowledge, isn't it? A contemporary of Licinius. He was an outstanding personality, both politically and spiritually. I have indicated on other occasions how spiritual forces were at work in the personality of Constantine and to some extent guided him in the difficult administration of the Western Empire. Today I should like to consider him from another standpoint. His spiritual makeup was such that he was unable to find a right relationship to the principles of an ancient initiation. In contrast to his predecessors and contemporaries, he shrank from coercing the Hierophants into granting him an initiation into the ancient mysteries. Wisely, the sibylline oracles and prophecies of Rome's impending downfall weighed heavily upon his soul. He was also aware of the Christian teaching that Rome would endure to the end of time. He was well informed on these matters, but he shrank from initiation into the mysteries. He shrank from carrying the war against the Christians into the realm of the mysteries. This has significant implications. I, I hold contention with this part, right, that the Christian teaching was that Rome would endure to the end of time. I do not find evidence of that through the Bible study. What we do find is that the control system, which is supposed to be related to the beast that we find in Revelation, is not Rome. It is instead the Islamic empires. We detail that as we go through the Bible study. What history tells of Constantine is extremely interesting and shows how he tried to find a modus vivendi, which Christianity by other means. How he set himself up as the protector of Christianity and introduced Christianity, as he understood it, into the Roman Empire. But he could not incorporate his form of Christianity into the old principle of initiation. He was faced with an insurmountable difficulty. Because the Christians themselves and their leaders were vigorously opposed to this. There's that control system rearing its head. They felt, and many even realized, that the mission of Christianity was to unveil the ancient mystery teachings, which until then had been kept secret in the mystery temples. That is not according to current Christianity, but it is according to the Apocrypha, which was a different recording of the mission of Christ. There is a reason it was excluded during the Council of Nicaea. It was their desire that the truths hidden in the mysteries should be proclaimed to the whole world and should not be restricted to the temples. I am of that opinion. 
Fundamentally, the aim of these initiated emperors was to deny Christianity to the people and to restore it again to the mystery temples. In that event, they believed, people would be initiated into Christianity in the same way as they had been initiated into the secrets of the ancient pagan mysteries. That is because the old Christians were still doing works. It was difficult for Constantine to achieve his goal in the face of the objectives pursued by the Christians. The Christians saw in the turning point of world history an event of a spiritual, non-temporal order, and their claim that the Roman Empire would endure must be understood as an expression of a holy spiritual impulse. And this is clearly reflected in the secret teachings of the early Christians. In maintaining that the Roman Empire would endure, they sought to anticipate what actually came to pass. I pointed out recently that the deeper impulse of the Roman Empire has not ceased, that it still lives on not only in jurisprudence but in other domains also, which, to those who do not probe more deeply, appear to be a new innovation. But in fact, we are simply witnessing a prolongation and extension of the driving forces behind Imperial Rome. Although the old Roman Empire is no more, its spirit still lives on and bites deeply into our civilization. That is true. Certain people maintain that we are haunted today and will always be haunted by the ghost of the old Roman Empire. And this is accepted as a truism by the educated even today and is unlikely to change. The Christians wish to draw attention to this, but at the same time, they contended that Christianity will always contain an element that is antagonistic to the Roman Empire, for the spiritual impulse in Christianity will always be at odds with the materialism of Rome, and this contention of the Christians was prophetic. You will now understand more clearly why the senators and the Roman emperors were alarmed for they naturally associated the decline that was prophesied with the external empire, which they saw slowly crumble under the impact of Christianity. And the em Emperor Constantine shared this view. Although not himself initiated, he was aware that a primordial wisdom had once existed in ancient times when man possessed atavistic clairvoyance. <clears throat> The wisdom had been transmitted to later ages and had been preserved by the priesthood, but had gradually become corrupted. In Rome, too, Constantine said to himself, Our social order embodies something that is associated with the institutions of this primordial wisdom, but we have simply buried it beneath the social order of a materialistic and secular empire. I do not disagree with that. This was expressed in a pregnant symbol that is an imagination, and not only an imagination, but also a hist an historical cult, cult act. For these imaginations often took the form of cult acts. People knew that in earlier times, wisdom was not an arbitrary invention of man, but was a revelation from the spiritual worlds. They knew that in primordial times, priest had preserved this wisdom, not in Rome, of course, but across the sea, in Ilion, in Troy, where they had originally dwelt. And this expressed in the legend of the Palladium, the so-called image of Pallas Athene, which fell from heaven in Troy, was preserved in a sanctuary, was then transferred to Rome and buried under a por por porphyry pillar. In all that was connected with this symbolic cult act, people felt that they were able to trace their civilization to the ancient wisdom, which they had received from the spiritual world, but that they could not reach the heights which this wisdom had known in ancient Troy. Such were the feelings Constantine harbored, and he also felt that even if he were not to be initiated into the later mysteries, they would be of little help to him. They would not lead him to the Palladium, to the ancient primordial wisdom. He therefore decided to challenge the cosmic powers, after his own fashion, in order to save the Roman Empire from destruction. He realized that this must be achieved in accordance with certain cosmic impulses, 
and that it would have to take place in accordance with certain cult acts, which were publicly enacted for all the world to see. He decided, therefore, to transfer the capital from Rome to the ancient site of the site of ancient Troy, to have the Palladium dug up and taken back to Troy. The plan miscarried. Instead of establishing a new Rome on the site of Troy, he decided to found a new city, Constantinople, transfer the power to her and thus save declining Rome for future ages. By these means, Constantine hoped to stem the tide of world evolution. He was prepared for Rome to become the habitat of foxes and wolves, as the Sibylline Oracle had foretold. But at the same time, he wished to transfer the hidden impulses of Rome to a new site, and so restore them to their original source. Constantine, therefore, embarked upon the ambitious plan to found Constantinople, and the work was completed in A.D. 326. He intended that the foundation of the city should coincide with this turning point in world history. He, therefore, chose to lay the foundation stone at the moment when the sun stood in the sign of the archer and the crab ruled the hour. He followed closely the indications of the cosmic signs. He wished to make Constantinople famous and to transfer to her the enduring impulse of eternal Rome. He, therefore, had the porphyry pillar, which was later destroyed by storms, transported to Constantinople. He ordered the palladium to be dug up and to be placed beneath the pillar. He also treasured among his possessions some relics of the cross and a few nails that had originally secured the cross. That is highly unlikely. The relics of the cross were made into a kind of frame to hold a much prized statue of Apollo and the nails into a nimbus with which he was crowned. This statue was set up as the porphyry pillar and an inscription was engraved on it which read somewhat as follows. That which sheds its beneficent influence here shall, like the sun, endure for all time and proclaim the fame of its founder, Constantine, to all eternity. These things must, of course, be taken more or less imaginatively, but with this qualification that they refer at all times to actual historical events. The whole story has passed over into legend and, transmuted, lives on in the following legend. The Palladium, for which is a symbol for a particular center of primordial wisdom, had been deposited originally in the secret mystery centers of the priest initiates of Troy. It came to light for the first time when it was transported by circuitous routes from Troy to Rome. And it saw the light of day a second time when it was transferred from Rome to Constantinople on the orders of Constantine. And those who believe the legend say that it will see the light of day a third time when it was transported from Constantinople to a Slavonic city. This legend is still vitally alive and survives in many things and under manifold forms. Today, many things which appear in their purely physical aspects conceal a deeper layer of meaning. Constantine therefore actively strove to prevent the downfall of the Roman Empire in spite of his firm belief in the prophecy of the Sibylline Oracle. He wanted to save Rome from herself. And what I have told you, I want you to recognize that the historical personality of Constantine, psychic impulses were at work, which had significant and far-reaching effects and bear in mind also what the earlier Christians and their leaders maintained. The Roman Empire will endure, and the Christ impulse we have received will also be realized and will be ever be present among us. Here we see two parallel phenomena of importance which have a significant bearing upon the different currents which have influenced the cultural development of the West. In particular, you would be able to form an idea of the attitude towards the Roman Empire in the early Christian centuries and in the age of Constantine, and of the sharply conflicting opinions on the way in which the future was envisaged. And you will, perhaps, find criteria which will enable you to see many of the later events in their true light. And we can only see many of these later events in proper perspective if we answer the following question. 
How far does the later development of Christianity, up to now, accord with its original intention? And what must be done to bring it into closer report with that intention? That is indeed an important question, and one that you should ask yourself if you are still involved in the control system. Jesus gave specific instructions, right? He was like, go forth and do. He was telling people to go out and heal. He told you to pray fast and meditate. He told you to seek God. He told you to proclaim the kingdom of his Father. What is What have been the effects of that? There is no healing, right? Straight off the top, people are in constant doubt about whether they have been saved. And they have centered, instead of around my Father, around the Son. That is, to me antithetical to the purpose of Christianity. It was not, according to Jesus, supposed to be about Jesus. It was, according to Jesus, supposed to be about God. That is an important distinction, and if you are still a member of the control system, it is something that you need to justify, at least to yourself. It remains for me to speak of a still more important moment in evolution in connection with the expansion of Christianity, the moment when an initiated emperor, called Julian the Apostate, came face to face with this emergent Christianity. From the results of our historical inquiry, we shall then be in a position to discuss in this context the further question. How can we prepare our souls to draw near to the Christ whose presence will be experienced in the etheric world in the present century? What steps was, must we take, especially in our present age, to draw near to him? In my next lecture, I should like to discuss the trends, the trend of events under Julian the Apostate, and to indicate the relation of our present age to the etheric Christ insofar as it is permissible to touch upon this question today. And so ends letter six, or lecture six. <clears throat> and again... I had several points of contention to which I brought light, but I did not have an, a lot to add to this. Most of this was historical context, and I don't hold the authority to dispute, right? I can announce my opinions, the things which I believe to hold, that I believe and I hold to be true, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are true, and so while I have expressed where I dis disagree I don't have the authority to disagree with you know the inner workings of Constantine or Nero I have not nearly done enough historical uh, analysis to be able to say no they really meant this because I don't know anything about them I do know a good bit about the Bible I have a whole 161 videos but there are more videos on this channel discussing the Bible from before that particular study, right? The lessons of the book titles will get you some of those. I used to be in a different place. The things I say now, I would have been, like many of you, completely dismayed to hear what I am saying. I try to couch this in love. I really do, because I'm not trying to step on toes. I do, but I don't try to. I'm trying to show you that there was something that happened. What he's talking about here, it was something that happened. But he is misaligned in the intentionality of it. Right? What happened was spirituality was taken away from the religion of Christianity. The original 11 apostles who made it past, those apostles were out there performing miracles. They were out there raising up new members. And then somewhere along the way, that disappeared. Well, the point in time in which that disappeared was roughly this, right? It was probably in the second century, right? The further separated you became from Jesus, the less they actually followed the writings of Jesus. And in the second century, we got the Gospels, which did a lot to break apart the actual teachings of Jesus. I know that that's going to be a point of contention for some people. A lot, a lot of people like to quote Paul. Paul is antithetical to the Gospel. <laughs> there are numerous problems associated with 
I have detailed them in a excruciating detail. Right? We went through step by step and showed in no uncertain terms that Judaism was wrong. It was fine then that it raised up from around or raised up a people from what was around them. But that doesn't mean that it was correct. We show that. The New Testament was doing the same thing. It was raising up from Judaism another section into a better understanding. But that understanding was more aligned with free spirituality, what I am doing, than it is at all with Christianity. Christianity separated that spirituality from you. Don't get that twisted. There are several denominations that will tell you in no uncertain terms that if you meditate, you are committing a sin. That is simply untrue. Jesus told you to meditate. That's what he was doing in the desert when he was tempted. We need to get back to the true roots. And the true roots is the father. Right now, the father is beyond gender. He is both genders. He is beyond if you were conceptualizing a sky daddy sitting on a throne waiting for you to mess up, you're wrong. That's not what it is. God is the overarching coordinator of coincidence. He is the, the entirety of the universe. He's not worried about whether or not you say a cuss word or whether or not you take a drink. The overarching story of your life probably plays a part in some things, but you're here to overcome temptations. That has been true throughout history. You are meant to overcome. And part of that overcoming, you can get through prayer, fasting, and meditation without the spiritual part. But if you are earnestly taking part in the prayers, fasting, and meditation, the spiritual part will come. You will come into accordance with God. He will reveal to you that which is correct and that which is not. And there's a lot in that book that is not. And I know that that steps on some toes. Hopefully I brought a little bit of enlightenment and not too much confusion to a somewhat difficult series of topics. Now, most of this was history and I'm not here to dispute that history happened. I'm not here to even dispute one man's interpretation of what happened in history. I do not know enough to bring up points of contention for a lot of this, and so I keep quiet. I merely relay the information and I clarify the things that I know. I know that you can go directly to God and do anything that I can. I assume that anyway, right? I don't know that because you're not doing them. But I assume that you can because God gave it to me and there was no price to pay. Nothing had to die. Your salvation does not rest upon anyone else. It never has and it never will. It rests upon you. And that is salvation in the broadest interpretation of the term because according to the Bible, there is no hell. I know that I hold some unconventional beliefs and that I have a tendency to step on toes when I relay those beliefs, but it is not intentional and I do not apologize for it. I am here to reveal truths. If you like what I'm doing over here, let me know down below. Give me a like, share, and a sub. Throw me a comment if you agree or disagree. If it remains respectful, it gets to remain up. And if there is some works that you would like to see me do in the, in the manner that we are doing here, let me know in the comments as well. If you really like what I'm doing, hit me with that super thanks because I do not manifest money to the crew. Thanks for hanging out. I appreciate every single minute that you are here with me, and I am praying for you every single day. Until next time, I love you. God loves you. You are perfect, whole, and complete just the way that you are. And this has been Pitt's Take. Peace.